In the previous lecture we started discussing the drugs used to prevent the formation of unwanted clots in the blood vessels. We said that there are three groups can be used for this purpose, the antiplatelet drugs, anticoagulants and fibrinolytics. We talked about the antiplatelet drugs. So today we'll discuss the anticoagulant drugs. We already know from the previous lectures what is the coagulation cascade, but we can summarize it, then talk about the anticoagulant drugs mechanisms. Blood coagulation is the process in which fibrin protein strands wrap around the platelet plug to form an insoluble clot. And this is done through two pathways, intrinsic and the extrinsic pathways. Both pathways have a common sequence, involves a complex that includes activated factor 10, factor 5, platelet phospholipids and calcium, that catalyzes the conversion of the serum protein prothrombin to thrombin. In turn, thrombin converts plasma fibrinogen to fibrin. Then fibrin monomers bind together forming a network that forms the insoluble clot. There are two important information you should know. Vitamin K is required for the synthesis of several coagulation factors. There are several endogenous inhibitors for the coagulation process. The most important one we should mention is antithrombin 3. It binds to thrombin and to factor 10A, and deactivates both of them. The main goal of anticoagulant drugs, is preventing the formation of fibrin, leading to inhibition of clot formation. So there are four main sites that drugs can act on, and inhibit or activate, according to its action. Activators of antithrombin 3, vitamin K and agonists, direct thrombin inhibitors, and selective factor 10A inhibitors. Today we'll discuss the activators of antithrombin 3, unfractionated heparin, and low molecular weight heparins, and they include inoxaparin, daltaparin, tinzaparin and nadraparin, and the synthetic pentasaccharide, fondaparinux. Let's start by defining them. Heparin is a naturally occurring highly acidic glycosaminoglycan of varying molecular weight from 5000 to 15000. It occurs naturally as a macromolecule, complexed with histamine and mast cells, and is extracted for commercial use from porcine intestinal mucosa. Low molecular weight heparins are heterogeneous compounds, about one third the size of unfractionated heparin. And as we said, fondaparinux is a synthetic pentasaccharide. They are administrated intravenously or subcutaneously. So what is the exact mechanism of action? Heparin binds to antithrombin via its pentasaccharide sequence. This induces a conformational change in the reactive center loop of antithrombin. That accelerates its interaction with thrombin in factor 10A. And there is another mechanism heparin does, to potentiate thrombin inhibition. It must simultaneously bind to antithrombin and thrombin, which is called bridging. But only heparin chains composed of at least 18 saccharide units, that corresponds to a molecular weight of 5400, are of sufficient length to perform this bridging function. Low molecular weight heparins, have greater capacity to potentiate factor 10A inhibition than inhibition of thrombin, by antithrombin. Because low molecular weight heparins chains, are too short to bridge antithrombin to thrombin as it has lower molecular weight than heparin. And the last agent, thondaparinux, which is a synthetic pentasaccharide, only accelerates factor 10A inhibition by antithrombin. Because the pentasaccharide is too short to bridge antithrombin to thrombin. Let's now talk about their therapeutic uses. These drugs are used in the treatment of acute venous thromboembolism, deep venous thrombosis or pulmonary embolism. They are also used for prophylaxis of postoperative venous thrombosis in patients undergoing surgery and those with acute myocardial infarction. A very important information you should know, these drugs are the anticoagulant drugs of choice for treating pregnant women because they do not cross the placenta due to their large size and negative charge. So what about their adverse effects? The most common adverse effect of heparin and low molecular weight heparin's therapy is bleeding. 
so dogs should be monitored closely, especially with heparin. Excessive bleeding may be managed by discontinuing the drug, or by treating with protamine sulfate. It combines ionically with heparin to form a stable, one-to-one -one inactive complex. Fondaparinux is not neutralized by protamine sulfate, and there is no antidote available to counteract bleeding disorders associated with overdosing. Hypersensitivity reactions may occur with heparin preparations, as they are obtained from porcine sources, so they may be antigenic. Reactions include fever, urticaria, chills, and anaphylactic shock. Heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is a serious condition that may also happen. This condition is characterized by an abnormally low number of platelets circulating in the blood. It is immune-mediated reaction that carries a risk of venous and arterial embolism. Heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is less likely with fondaparinux than with heparin, but is still a possibility. Osteoporosis has been observed in patients on long-term heparin therapy. Fondaparinux is eliminated unchanged in urine, so it is contraindicated in patients with severe renal impairment. Low molecular weight heparins have largely replaced unfractionated heparin because they have a longer half-life than standard heparin, so they require only a single daily dose by subcutaneous injection. Prophylactic doses do not require monitoring, and thrombocytopenia is rare. And fondaparinux may be superior to low molecular weight heparins. That's all for this video. In the next lecture we'll keep talking about the other anticoagulant drugs. So subscribe and wait for the next video.